in certain cases, up to 60% of their seed base is from saved seed. And, and that's really essential. And if you don't understand that and you make a policy that stifles that and the ability of farmers, organic farmers, but also other farmers, to save their seed in the right ways and use them in the right ways, then you're going to basically strangle what is a really strong success story and a really strong growing economic concern for the country. And the, the members of parliament listen to that. They listen to data and they listen to money. And so that's really important. So this, you know, this is like just happening last week, but it's really timely. And I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about some of that. One of the other things the, the study did was it helped us understand derogations. And this is another one of our plow downs. We all know that we use a lot of seed derogations, that we go to our certifiers and we ask to use non-organic seed, untreated seed, but it's not certified, um, and for a variety of reasons. And one of them is the problem that nobody's developing or breeding seed that is appropriate to, or very few are breeding seed that are appropriate to our agronomic needs in our specific geographical locations. And, and that is a problem, and we need to put more investment into that, and we need to develop our own regionally specific seeds. And this Bauda initiative is really important because it is helping us do that. And this study gets into the specific crops, the, the most demanded crops, but we looked at derogations too. And what we're seeing is that the derogations, we did a, a survey of inspectors, and the derogations are continuing or even growing. And so we need to do some due diligence in our own camp and try to support and foster more purchasing of organic seed as well. We, we have to get off the derogation train a little bit and, and start to diversify our organic seed base because if we don't have that, we have nothing to go back to if the seed system changes. And so we really need to encourage and foster and pay for some of the organic seed that's out there. So that's one of our um, plow downs, I think, for our sectors. We need to do a better job at home of making sure that we're sourcing organic seed and we're supporting people who are trying to develop organic seed for our need. And if you don't have a seed that's for your need, then you need to begin connecting with others and try to develop that. So Bill C-18, you heard me talk, you've probably heard a lot of people talking and concerned around UPOV 91. Um, we've been working at CODA, we've been working on this for a few months, and we tried to take a really kind of slow and steady approach to this. We didn't want to get um, carried away with the, with the sort of the dangers or the rhetoric around it. We really wanted to understand, well, who else in the world is using UPOV 91? How is their organic sector working with it? And is it as bad as it sounds? And to be honest, this current legislation isn't that ominous, but it sets the stage for further regulations down the road that could be quite um, serious for us. And so that's, it's really about diligence and about caution and about paying attention and about showing up, and that's what we've been doing. So C-18 changes a whole bunch of previous acts, and it's, it's uh, really hard to actually read this legislation because uh, it's an omnibus bill and so what it says is we're going to change this sentence over in this act and this sentence over in that act and we're going to change the definition of this over here and so you can't read it and actually get an understanding of what exactly is happening. What will the new agricultural act look like for Canada? But as you can see it's changing just about every fundamental agricultural act there is and the changes will be substantial when it's done. Most of the attention is being put into the Plant Breeders' Rights and the Seeds Act. Uh, and that's really some of the things that are, that are being introduced here. And it comes, the, the, the legislation proposed includes uh, this concept of farmer's privilege. And so um, the farmer's privilege is basically looking at seed saving practices. And it, it says farmer's privilege is an exemption to the breeder's right that allows a farmer to save and reuse seed of a plant breeder right protected variety for replanting on their own farm. Doesn't sound so bad, but it's really vague and it has some problems in it around whether you can condition seed, whether you can continue to plant that seed, and, and what sort of um, royalties you may uh, at a certain point have to pay. There's an endpoint royalty system that could come in through the UPOV 91 system, and that would mean that whatever you harvest you pay the royalty on, not what you buy, but what you harvest. And so that's, 
that's really dangerous in, in many regards and could be very expensive. But it could also put, a, it could put in place a power where um, millers or handlers or even manufacturers would be responsible for showing that everything they'd bought had paid the royalty. And if it hadn't, then they would be liable for that. So the, this isn't in the bill, it's not in the act. But it could be in one of the regulations that comes later. So that's what we're, we're raising that. And what we've done, um, one of my board members, Dwayne Smith from, from Grainworks, uh, flew to Ottawa. He was, I called him, he was literally on the combine when I called him. And I said, Dwayne, we've been invited to testify before the House Standing Committee on Agriculture. I'll do it, but I would really love you to be there because your voice will carry weight and carry conviction that I can't bring. And he, he said, I'm on the combine. When do I need to be there? I said, the day after tomorrow. And he said, well, hope that it rains, but I'll come. And it rained, which was great. And, uh, and so Dwayne came, he flew in, and we, he flew in that, the night before, so he actually came tomorrow. Uh, he flew in the night before, and we, uh, we met quickly, uh, sat in the parking lot of a hotel for, I think, an hour while we talked about some of the issues, uh, picked him up in the morning, and we went and testified before the committee about some of our concerns from the organic sector. Later that month, this is back in October, later that month we also, we shared all of our information, all of our notes, all of our briefing, briefing packages with other organizations and we got, um, the committee invited the Canadian Organic Growers, the Organic Council of Ontario, uh, uh, Food Secure Canada and a number of our other partners to the table and we were able to really collaborate and coordinate some of those messaging and what we've heard from that committee, and in fact, I met with the chair of that committee last week in Ottawa, and he told me, we're changing, we're gonna make our own amendment. The Conservative Party is going to propose a couple of amendments to the farmer's privilege to help clarify it and help address some of the concerns that we've heard. So we haven't seen that amendment yet, but this is how the organic sector needs to continue to engage and really develop that relationship with government and say, look, we're growing, we have money, we have real opportunity, and we have success for farming families across the country. And, and we need you to listen to us and work with us on what we can do. Um, there's some other issues around seed that is working on, um, and, and this comes back to the contamination issue. Uh, we have a task force that struck, and I won't get into this in too much detail, but I, I'm sure that any of you selling to Europe over the last couple of years, few years, have seen real uh, challenges around glyphosate residues. And I know there's some great research being done out here in the prairies as well, looking at some of the sources of that contamination. So we've been working and we actually got some government funding to pull together and create a task force and, and we'll open that up even beyond our membership. So anybody here who's directly impacted by that issue, I encourage you to be in touch with me. We're, we're collecting data, we're trying to collect stories, we're trying to understand and we've probably done one of the most comprehensive studies so far of international literature on glyphosate residues, where it comes from. The Europeans are thinking that it's uh, you know, a, a handling and transport problem or maybe a fraud problem. And what we're seeing more and more is evidence that suggests it's an environmental problem. It's a contamination. There's so much glyphosate in the system, in the drinking water, in everything now that it's starting to hit organic crops and show up. And that's a big problem. And if you think that's bad, wait for 2,4-D to start showing up and what will happen to our organic exports at that point. So that's a task force we've struck and we're really trying to get all of the information. So people who have done testing and you don't want to share that testing, we need you to share that and that's another plow down. We need you to share it with us, we'll keep it in confidence, we'll aggregate it so nobody can ever know your data results, but we need to have that information so that we can better understand and we can lobby and work with the Europeans to open that market up again and, and have them understand what the problem is and where the glyphosate's coming from and then we can start to address and, and mitigate the damage of that. The other one is looking at GMOs. Code has been asked by the, um, the Canadian General Standards Board Technical Committee. This is the group that sets our organic standards. We've been asked to provide sort of a secretariat role on the issue of GMO and in particular, at, you know, 
do we need testing thresholds? Do we need to look at our seed base? How do we address GMO contamination if there ever is some inorganic? And so we've started doing that work, assisting that committee, doing international um, studies to, to look at what other sectors are doing around the issue of GMO contamination and, and uh, other standards that are out there to understand this issue. And we're also working with industry leaders to start preparing our message around GMOs and organics and understanding how organic is non-GMO and what that means. And so this is, these are a couple of things that still relate to seed that I think are really, really important for our sector. One of the things that we like to do is try and um, make pretty pictures of things. Um, we don't have a lot of data for organic, it's one of our biggest problems. Um, we can't get very much data out there and we're, we're constantly working and we're teaming up with government, with provincial groups, with other associations, with producers, with handlers, everybody to try and collect as much data as we can. But when we do get some data and we get a little piece that seems sexy, then we like to do something with it. So these are two pieces that we brought to Ottawa last week. Um, I wouldn't say the cows are that sexy, but uh, We'll, we'll just stop that one there. Um, but uh, anyways, this is part of our success story. This is from the census of agriculture. And what we did was we, you know, we're all poor. Our associations are poor. We don't have a lot of money. But at a certain point, we said, you know what? It's probably worth the $2,000 to buy a custom tabulation of the 2011 agriculture census and have them pull out all of the organic respondents and compare it to the total. And what we found were a, a number of things, but a couple of the ones that we really like is that although we're 1.8% of uh, total farms in Canada, we're, we're close to employing 4% of the, the farm labor in the country. So we're actually, we're creating jobs at twice the rate of conventional farming. There's, there's no way to refute that. That is the census of agriculture. Organic creates more farm jobs. We're also younger. We're attracting new entrants. And we all know about that crisis, that impending crisis, the, the, the blue hair farmer issue where everybody's going to be retiring soon and becoming snowbirds. And uh, I see a couple of you reaching out to each other. That's cute. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but organic, we have another decade. So for any of you that were thinking of retiring, you've got 10 more years at least <laughs> to keep farming. Um, no, but we are. We're bringing new people in at a faster rate, and we're, we're, we're younger. So we are the future of farming. And, and these are things, these are, these are data points that we can convincingly remind ourselves and, and share and help build that momentum and help build some of that um, interest in organic, uh, both at a policy level and at a production level. So I think these are really, really good pieces to, to look at. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do more and more of is trying to tell who the farmer is and show who the farmer is in Canada, the organic farmer. And we've got, I'll talk about the Think Before You Eat campaign uh, a little bit later. And there, there's a session tomorrow, I, I hope it's tomorrow, that I'm leading on the Think, the Think campaign. And one of the, the website elements that's really important is putting a face to Canadian organic farmers. So who they are, what they grow, where they are, and why they became organic. And we're just starting to roll those out across the country uh, on this website. And it's really fun because for the consumer, I mean, that's really what they want. They want to see the farmer in the field. They want to know who they're buying from and they want to have a better understanding of that. So that's something this message helps us with. But we're also trying to actually put nice photographs and quick little bios up on the website and help communicate that to, to our 20,000 consumers who now follow us on social media. So through Organic Week and through the Think Before You Eat campaign, we're starting to build that direct relationship with consumers that I talked about earlier, which is so important for organic. So speaking of Organic Week, this is something that Coda helped found with uh, the Canadian Organic Growers about five years ago. And Laura Telford's here. Uh, she and I um, had a great talk one night in a pub in Ottawa. And uh, we had both been talking to other people uh, who said, you know, we need something to celebrate. I know Arnold Taylor uh, also had, you know, a, a strong idea of this kind. And, uh, and we said, well, let's, you know, it was, it was 2009. The market had just tanked. Everybody was, like, ready to just walk off the edge of a cliff. 
and, and we had this great idea with some beer involved to start a, a big promotion campaign um, and, and a sponsorship ask in the middle of that. And we thought, well, it probably won't go very far. But we were really pleasantly surprised. Uh, the response was immediate. A bunch of the, the brands and retailers got behind it right away. And this year, for Organic Week, uh, we doubled the size of Organic Week from last year. We had 25 sponsors. We had uh, the Globe and Mail um, put out a, uh, a, a section in the national paper that was eight pages long. It was a whole section of the globe uh, that was just on organics using our data and our information. And I have a few of those, but I think they're sitting in my hotel room. So I'll have them here tomorrow, if not later today. Um, we had Loblaws and Sobies come to us and ask to be official sponsors and participating retailers in their locations across the country. Plus we had a lot of independent retailers. So we had 1,600 retail locations participating in Organic Week. We had 200 events across the country that were anybody can hold an event. And we, I encourage all of you for next year to hold an event. You can do a farm tour, you can have a kitchen table meeting, you can do a, a screening uh, of a movie, you can do a, a harvest meal. Uh, it all it all comes in under the tent. We put it up online. We tweet about it. We put it on Facebook. People come out. It's great. We send you literature. And it just helps show that vibrance of organic in Canada. Um, so a great event this year. And next year, it will be the same, like that third week of September. I know it's sometimes a, an awkward week for those of you in the fields. But it's when there's a lot of food out there, a lot of fresh organic production and, and produce available. So um, it's a really good time for the consumer. And this is really who we're targeting here. Uh, that's some more of our uh, Organic Week uh, propaganda. So it's really, you know, we, we took out ads in um, consumer magazines, in newspapers, in English and in French across the country. We had the social media, which is really important. Um, so we have a Facebook site and we have a uh, uh, a Twitter, a couple of Twitter accounts, and we really rely on our provincial partners across the country. Um, they do a lot to bring the events to to us. Like we can't go out and plan 200 events, um, so we really rely on producers, on companies, on retailers, and on especially the provincial associations to kind of galvanize and 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 collectively bring people together to do something for Organic Weekend. So next year it'll be, I think, uh, September 19th to. 27th, something, whatever that Saturday to Saturday is in the third week of September. I don't have my calendar in front of me right now, but um, and that's uh, I encourage everybody to get involved in Organic Week. Um, one of the other uh, outreach pieces to engage with the consumer and to start telling them a bit more about organic, helping them to understand organic, um, but also helping them to. Uh, to identify who the organic producer is and why they're why they're supportive and, and and why they want more organic is this think before you eat campaign and this was also developed through the organic value chain roundtable so Laura spoke earlier about the business case models the organic value chain roundtable uh, worked with us on this was a campaign that was supported by them and we actually hired um, with with the government's uh, help. We hired a firm out of Toronto that does brand work and, and brand designs. And these guys did um, that really noisy, crinkly bag for sun chips that's biodegradable. They did the uh, Lipton tea bags that were circular so that they fit in the bottom of your cup because I know, like me, everybody was so irritated by those square bags that didn't fit in the bottom of the cup. <laughs> Um, they, also, uh, they also did the uh, TD Canada Trust green armchair, if you ever saw that, that, that easy chair that's just like everywhere. That was their little gem. And they really wanted to work with us, uh, with the organic sector, because they really believe in organics. And they wanted to come up with 